Uh, happy Palm Sunday. We are so glad that you decided to spend a little bit of your weekend with us. I want you to know you are not just checking a box being in church today. I believe something powerful can happen in your life. Uh, whether you know this or, or you don't, you are in a house of faith. You are surrounded by believers. And when we come together, anything is possible. And I just believe that miracles are going to happen today. I don't know if you know this, but today is Miracle Sunday. I made that up this morning. Why? Because I just believe miracles can happen. And maybe you're here today. You might be a little low on faith. I got you. In fact, the people on your right and the people on your left got you too. In fact, I want you to do that. On your right and your left, just look at your neighbor and say, I got you today. I got you today. Something powerful can happen. I don't know what your journey's been with God, but you did not stumble into the building. You did not just turn on a, a link. No, today could be your day. Uh, I'm looking at the men of the return that just came back. Come on, can we make some noise for them once again? Where's Eric? I'm looking for Eric. Where's Eric? Eric, you're welcome here. You the man, and I want you to know you're in the room for a reason. And God has got a special plan for you, my friend, and I don't ever want you to give up on it. You understand that? Come on, make some noise for Eric. You got an army behind you, bro. You got an army behind you. Andrizo it is. If you don't know what Andrizo is, we did not say chorizo, it's Andrizo. <laughs> if you don't know what the return is, um, it's, it's a getaway that we do for men. We also have one called the well for women. Um, it's where you can go on a deep dive, and I promise you it will absolutely change your life. If you've never been to the return, never been to the well, um, I encourage you uh, to find out more information. There's so many wonderful dream teamers out there that would love to tell you more about it. Uh, today, uh, we are going to dive into what it means to celebrate Palm Sunday uh, all across the world today. People who are followers of Jesus are celebrating what we like to call Palm Sunday to commemorate the significance of Jesus entering into Jerusalem uh, just a couple of days before he would indeed be crucified. Uh, I think entrances are important. Uh, they signify the kind of person that you are, the way you enter into the room. I don't know if you've ever had people come over to your house before, and the way they entered in, they just had an energy that sometimes can be positive. Uh, maybe they've had an energy that sometimes it can be negative. Uh, I go to the gym a lot. I'm, I'm fascinated how people enter into the gym because some people are there to work out, um, and then there's other people that the way that they come into the building they're not there to work out. They're there to be seen, okay? You know what I'm talking about? Like, I'm talking about people, they outfits, it's unnecessary. Some people come in shirt off, sir, put your shirt on, okay? I don't know what you're trying to prove out here, but just work out, all right? Leave us alone, shaking the protein shake all hard, like trying to, trying to make a scene for everybody. Like, man, just shake it like a normal person. Like, it's like they're trying. They, they, I've seen more phones at the gym than ever before. Tripod, Lifetime Fitness shouldn't even let you do this, okay? You an influencer? It's like what they are posing to be chosen. You know what I'm saying? Like, there is... There is something about the way that they came. You're just like, you didn't even come here to work out. I mean, there are some people here right now. Some of us, we came to praise the Lord. And then some of us came looking to get booed up. You came in. It's a club outfit you got on. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, like they came in. They entered, you know, scoping and hoping. You know what I'm talking about? That's my king. Hey, girl, what's up? Like, there's a little bit more to it. Uh, here's, here's what I want us to do today. I want to look at how Jesus entered into Jerusalem. It's going to tell us a lot about who he is. I'd love to draw our attention to some historical context. There's some things that we find in the Word of God about this story. And then there's some things that we find in simple Roman history, Jewish history, that I believe are going to give us uh, some color to the story that perhaps you haven't seen before and essentially what on earth it means for you and for me. Luke 19, 
starting in verse, let's go verse 28. Scripture says, it says, when he had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem, and it came to pass when he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mountain called Olivet, that he sent two of his disciples, saying, go into the village opposite you, whereas you will enter, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Loose it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you loosing it? Thus, thus shall say to him, because the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent their way and found out it just as he had said to them, but as they were loosing the colt, the owners of it said to them, why are you loosing the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of him. Then they brought him to Jesus. Uh, this is an interesting note to me because we don't know which two disciples Jesus chose. If it's me and I'm one of the disciples, I think it's a draw straw situation, maybe rock, paper, scissors, shoot to see who's going to go and essentially uh, have a little grand theft auto. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, like okay, Jesus, I know we, we, we follow you, but you, you, just, we, you ain't going to be there. So you're going to send us to somebody else's house and don't even ring the doorbell. You just want us just to start taking stuff. I, I'm a little bit nervous. I'm glad he sent two. It's like in case something happened to one of y'all, need at least one of y'all to come back with the donkey. And, and it, it's interesting that the instructions that he gives them is, hey, you'll find a cult. In other words, hey, I've already gone before you. And I know what's there, but more importantly, I know who's there. And what I marvel at the most is that this unknown and unnamed cult owner, Jesus says, if there's any trouble, here's the secret password. The Lord has need of it. If this was happening in Texas, none of us would do this because you'd get shot, okay? Like, like, like you just ain't going to mess around in Texas, all right? So, so, but in case they pull out things and say, hey, man, what you doing with my stuff? Hey, 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 the Lord has need of it. And if it, that's exactly what happened. They're untying the coat. They're like, all right, man, let's get out of here quick before he come out and say, hey, what you doing with my stuff? The Lord has need of it. He's like, all right, man, keep going. Do what you do. Man, go ahead. Hand to hand to your business. And uh, here, here's the only important thing you need to know about this cult owner. And it's the only real detail that we can tell about this person is that in his life, Jesus is Lord. Which is significant because I think you and I could be faced with a dilemma on the Easter season. Because I think Jesus can be Savior and not Lord. Because everybody needs saving. You're like, yeah, I need some rescue. I need some help. I'd love to have a God that I could call on in a midnight hour. He's Savior. Thank you for what you've done for me, for saving my life. Lord, that's different. Lord is, you're in charge, and so I got to go the direction that you actually want me to go. Uh, you could sing songs in church, and he still not be Lord. You could serve at the church, and we're grateful that you do. And he still not be Lord. The secret password is the Lord has need of it. This is a person that just, we don't know much about except that at some point in his life, he has made Jesus Lord. And when Jesus is Lord, Jesus can count on you to be where you need to be when you need to be there to be a blessing to somebody else. And I don't know about you. But I want to be a cult owner type of Christian because you can need a blessing or you can be a blessing. And when you're trying to be a blessing, I think you pray different because I think you have a different mindset because you can come to church with the mindset of, I hope somebody bless me today. I need a blessing. Lord, I need a job. Lord, I need a raise. Lord, I need a promotion. And, and there could be this thing about what you need and what you need and what you need. But when you have a cult owner type of mindset of going, you know what, today, I don't know, regardless of the size of my resources, I am looking for an opportunity to be a blessing to somebody else. And I just want to help somebody's mindset for a minute who's been stuck in I need a blessing mode their entire life. You may have been there for a decade. 
always praying for a blessing, and I'm not saying you shouldn't be, but in the middle of that, I think you have the ability to go, you know what, tomorrow I'm going to be a blessing to somebody. Tomorrow I have been put on this planet to be a blessed, I, I want to be a cult owner kind of Christian that God can count on in any moment to say, I know I can trust Ryan and Amanda that wherever they go, they're going to be in a position to be a blessing to other people. The story continues in verse 36. It says this, it says, and they threw on clothes on the colt and they set Jesus on them. And as he sent, as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. Then, as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. This is his entrance into Jerusalem. Now, if you would allow me, I would love to compare and contrast someone else's entrance into Jerusalem that was happening near the same time. For us to understand the significance of that, we need to go back to a guy by the name of Herod the Great. They're going to put a map up behind me. This is the region in which Herod the Great truly ruled. Uh, During the Roman Empire, there was a time where this was a region where people simply refused to bow to Caesar. And so this was a particularly a region where they were trying to figure out what are we going to do with this region. And uh, the Jewish leaders at the time, they said, hey, we need somebody that can kind of be a go-between between us and the Roman Empire. So they made a deal with Herod the Great. They said, hey, we'll let you be king of the Jews. We'll let you run the region. Let us have our part. You have your part. And so Herod the Great was brilliant. He actually went to the Roman government and said, hey, here's the deal. Um, I got a lot of money. His family owned the spice trade. Uh, They say that he, uh, uh, some historians say he's one of the wealthiest men to ever live on the planet. And it's not close. And so he, he brokered this relationship to say, all right, I'll run this region. I'll keep this region under control. And he did a phenomenal job at doing that from the Roman government's perspective. But then he died. And so then what he did is he split the regions in three and gave them to his sons. And you can see the split here on this next map. So you can see uh, there was a territory of Herod Antipas. That's your Galilee and Tiberias. So if you see Herod Antipas in the in the the Gospels, that's the region we're talking about. And then you have the territory of, of Philip, that's uh, Trachonitas and Iturea up there. And then there's, this is a, a, a significant region here. This is Archelaus. His third son is running this larger region, except he wasn't very good at his job. In fact, he only lasted two years. And then Tiberius of the Roman government decided to say, all right, We need to send in what some historians call Rome's bulldog. They say, hey, we need somebody to get this region under control. His name is Pontius Pilate. So Pontius Pilate is sent in to say, get this stuff under control. Now, now Herod the Great was also known for his architecture. He was the Steve Jobs of architecture in the day. And uh, this is one of the, the harbors that he built for Caesar. In fact, he built like a whole city in honor of Caesar. You can see this whole uh, coastline here. This is what Herod the Great did. Not 20 years ago, 2,000 years ago. There are architects today still trying to figure out how he got underwater cement here 2,000 years ago. It's magnificent. Stephen and, and took, took me and some young adults to, to actually go see this region. It is absolutely beautiful. Now, uh, this is a region called Caesarea Martima. And this is where Pontius Pilate would stay. He's like, I don't really want to stay in Jerusalem. I want to keep everything under control from a, a higher perspective. However, during Passover, which is when Jesus is entering into Jerusalem, Uh, Pontius Pilate would come in as well. He would have his own entrance because during Passover, Passover is the celebration of what? Exodus. 
a bunch of people saying, you know what, we're sick of you, we leave it. And so the Roman government's like, hey, we need to have our presence felt at this feast just in case people have too many bottles of wine and get some crazy ideas. So let's keep our presence here pretty thick. And so you can see on this next map, this is the route that Pontius Pilate would take to enter into Jerusalem. Now, Herod had built multiple palaces and houses for Roman governors. So, think of it like this. Herod the Great had a couple Airbnbs for Pontius Pilate, okay? Are you with me? All right, so, so he would go from one Airbnb to the next Airbnb, and he would enter the city from the west, and he would do so with an army and on a stallion. Let everybody know, I'm in charge, don't get any crazy ideas. Do you understand? And if you get out of pocket, I can have one of my soldiers wipe you off the map right now. This is happening from the west. Here's Jesus' map. He's coming from the east, which is significant about the Messiah coming from the east. And if we compare and contrast two different entrances, you've got Pontius Pilate coming in with his army and his force and says, I dare you. You got Jesus <laughs> coming in from the east with a few teenage fishermen, <laughs> one zealot ex-gang member, <laughs> and a homie who used to work for the IRS. Real scary group, you know what I mean? <laughs> I will audit you right now and say something about Jesus. Like, what, what are we doing? What are we talking about? That's who he's entering the east from. In fact, in scripture, what you will find is emissaries uh, would often send donkeys overloaded with gifts to appease the wrath of an enemy, preventing bloodshed. That's the significance of donkeys in scripture. Uh, Jacob, Esau, they had their rivalry. At one point, Jacob sent donkeys packed with treasures to avoid the wrath of his brother Esau. Uh, you could see that in Genesis 32 and Genesis 33. Uh, in 1 Samuel, we see Abigail. She takes 200 loaves of bread, two skins of wine, 100 cakes of raisins, and 200 cakes of pressed figs and wilderness provisions for David and his men and loaded them on donkeys and sent them to David to spare her family. My friends, on Palm Sunday, Jesus is the gift that would prevent bloodshed for you and for me. Uh, it's interesting. I love reading the Gospels to learn about Jesus. I also love reading history to learn about Jesus because I'm just so fascinated as to how people who aren't Christians see Jesus. And it's interesting. Now, there are actually some critics of Jesus who would say that he knew the scriptures well and therefore he lived his life trying to fulfill messianic prophecies and sort of manufacture his lordship. So this moment would be one of those because Jesus and everyone in this audience, in this context, they knew the Zechariah prophecy very well which states this in Zechariah chapter 9. It says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now, they knew this text well. They knew this prophecy well. And so you got Pontius Pilate coming in. You're like, ah, I see you, Pontius Pilate. That's cool. And then they look the other direction, they go, donkey? Oh, it's go time. <laughs> now, for those that would have criticism of Jesus, say, hey, he knew the prophecy. So he chose to ride on the donkey. Yeah, but to do so as a perfect man would be suicide. <laughs> Who would choose crucifixion? In fact, uh, I was curious about this idea that I actually went and studied a little bit of history of people that have 
uh, thought that they were the Messiah in history since Jesus. Like, in my mind, I'm going, if not Jesus, then who? Um, there was a guy in the mid-1600s, okay, he had a pretty large following. There was no social media, so I can't prove how many followers he had, okay? I don't know if he went viral. I don't know if he had TikTok, but there was a lot of people, according to history. Uh, his name was Sabbatai Zavi, and he was a rabbi who proclaimed himself to be the Messiah in 1666. And apparently, uh, across the Jewish world, he actually got a pretty large belief system. People going, I, I, I think he's the guy. However, uh, he got arrested by Ottoman authorities. And when he got arrested for being the Messiah, he converted to Islam to avoid execution. <laughs> and so... Just get this in your head. Let's just say somebody was like, you know what? I'm going to live my life to be like the Messiah and try and fulfill these prophecies. You would do so until it was persecution time, okay? You'd be like, you know what? It ain't even that serious. I'm not the Messiah. I'm just a guy. As a matter of fact, I'm Islam. Like, like what happened? <laughs> no, Jesus, he knew, and he chose death anyways for you, for me. And this donkey move, it's one of the first moves that is going to get a perfect man crucified. And he knows it. And you can see that this donkey move upset the established order. We can see it in Luke 19, verse 39. It says, and some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, teacher! Rebuke your disciples. And I love Jesus' response. It's the iconic statement. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Jesus is going, I mean, I would if I could, but it ain't going to really fix your problem. Like, you, praise is going to happen with or without them. I, I can't speak for you, but I'm a worshiper. I, I just... I'm, I love heaven. I'm thinking about it every day, and I can't wait. Like, some people are like, I don't really like singing. I don't really like that worship stuff. You're going to be very disappointed in heaven. I'm going to tell you that right now, okay? Because if you don't praise them there, somebody will. It's going to be me, rocks, water. It don't matter. Like, something is going to happen. And I just tell people, here's the deal. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. You can do it now or you can do it later, but it's going to happen. So for me, I'm like, I'm trying to practice all the days of my life. Because here's what I guarantee you. I don't know where you are with your relationship with God. But one day you will stare face to face with Jesus Christ. And in that moment you'll go, I should have praised him more. I should have sang a little bit more. I should have surrendered a little bit more when we gaze into the beauty of who he is. I think we'll look, look back and go, what was I doing that whole time that I did, couldn't lift my hands and lift up a shout of praise to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. The day's coming. Whether you like it or not, it's going to happen. And I just, I love Jesus' statement like, hey, the rocks, are, you pick Humans, rocks, if you tried to throw the rocks away, the ocean would, like, you're going to lose today. I just wish he would have let him, because that would have just been cool. You know what I'm saying? All of a sudden, the rocks begin to rumble. Hosanna. You're like, y'all hear that? Where that's coming from? <laughs> y'all better shut up. Who is that? I didn't say nothing. It wasn't me. It was a rock. You told me to be quiet. Like, I would just love <laughs> that scene. But he's worthy of praise. Your life may not be perfect. I know. I don't know anybody's life who is. But he's always worthy of praise. Now, the donkey move upset religious leaders. But the second move when he got off the donkey was the straw that broke the camel's back. Matthew 21, 12 says, Then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer. But you, 
have made it a den of thieves. Unfortunately, the historical context here is there was corruption inside the religious leadership. And, and here's, here's how it worked. The context here is that they have turned a holy place into a market on the Temple Mount. And on this Temple Mount was a whole section that was designed for Gentiles. If you don't know what a Gentile is, that's, that's just an outsider, someone that's non-Jewish, somebody that's not a part of the club. And they weren't allowed to even go into the courts of the temple. They can only get close to the temple and look at God, gaze on God, worship God, if you will, from a distance. It would be like us saying, hey, uh, we love you, but if you don't follow our rules and if you're not good enough, you can only watch online, but you're not allowed to come in person. But you'd be like, wait, what? That was the Levitical system that was set up. They say, hey, we got a special section for you. You come here if you want to participate in our thing. And so this section was, was sacred for the Gentile to say, hey, you can stay here and be on the outside looking in. This space is reserved for them. This is their space. And what the priesthood had done in that day and age, what the chief priest had done, is turn this section for outsiders into a marketplace. A place of worship designated for the outsider, they had turned it into a market for convenience. Um, In my studies, I learned about what's called the the booths of Ananus. Now, Ananus is the Hebrew way you say Anas, A-N-N-A-S. And it's the same... Annas that you find in the gospel accounts when it comes to the trial of our risen Savior. And uh, the booths of Ananas were run by the priesthood. And when you came to the temple, uh, you had Roman money. And if you had Roman money, you weren't even allowed to take that Roman money into the temple mount because uh, that would be considered idolatry. So you had to exchange it. And so you had to use a proper currency so that you weren't committing idolatry when you gave your tithes and offerings. Uh, just imagine if we did that today in church. Okay, oh, yeah, we're going to need crypto from you or else you're in danger of idolatry. Like that, that is what's happening here. And, and they also needed sacrifices. And these sacrifices needed to be approved. And so the priest said, hey, don't worry. Uh, we're we're going to take this section for Gentiles. We're going to turn it into a marketplace and we're, we're going to, We're going to sell approved sacrifices. So guess who sold the sacrifices? The priest. Uh, Guess who decided whether or not the sacrifice was good enough? The priest. Uh, Guess who set the price on those sacrifices? The priest. Guess who raised the sacrifices? The priest. It would seem like this is a system that is ripe for a little bit of corruption. And they planted it smack dab in the middle of the place that was supposed to be designated for worship, for the outsider. And here's our Jesus. Jesus said, people were supposed to come into my father's house and connect with their dad. Uh, People were supposed to come into my father's house and get some hope. People were supposed to come to my father's house and get some peace. Those that literally felt like they were on the outside looking in has now been turned into something that it was never supposed to be. Perhaps you've heard of snapping Jesus before, but let's just be honest. Every time we've heard the story of Jesus flipping tables, it's the most un-Jesus thing we see. We're like, it just doesn't make sense. He's just so nice. And the children on the lap is kind of the photo. And, you know, passing out fish to people. You're hungry. Okay, great. Helping the homeless. You know, the woman calling the doji. Oh, it's okay. You'll be all right. Go and sin no more. Like, like you just, you have this, like, very nice Jesus picture. And then you have this one. You're like, this just feels like, Jesus, you should probably calm down. Okay, it's really not that big of a deal. Could you try talking to them? Like, pray for them or you know like can't you do something else but it's like flipping table Jesus is kind of hard for us to wrap our minds around but without the next verse you won't know why he flipped the table and the next verse is why I think we came to church today because he flips tables absolutely he snapped absolutely but verse 14 is why read it with me it says this it says Then 
the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. He's cleared the decks for the outsider, the rejected, the blind and the lame, outcasted by society, a throwaway. For every person that hasn't gotten it right the first time, Jesus cleared the tables for you. For every divorcee, Jesus cleared the tables for you. For every person who says, I don't know the songs, I don't, I don't know the verses, good. He cleared the tables for you. And a den of thieves got turned into a house of miracles. That's why he flipped tables. Uh, interestingly enough, this region today, this very spot is still controversial. And I believe in the end, God will get his spot back. Not because he's territorial, but because he cares about every broken person. And he wants everybody to know him. He wants everybody to be connected to him. The disappointed, the discouraged, the brokenhearted. He cleared the, he cleared the space so that they could be healed. I just, the next time you see palm branches waved in the air like they just don't care. May you and I remember that a Savior cleared a path for us to experience him in a powerful and fresh way. He's got the donkey move. He's got the table flip move. You got to understand something. He's only about three or four days from being crucified. He's like one last trick. Get this out of the way so that the people that I actually came for can actually receive. And I just believe that today you are sitting, you are participating online in a place that I truly believe is a house of miracles. Uh, last service, uh, we started praying for miracles and impromptu, we, it, it, we turned it into a little testimony service, you know, old school. You know, some people started to testify. And uh, I started pinging different staff members to say, do we got some miracles going on in the building today? Um, I learned about Edward. Where's Edward? Edward, where you at? Edward, raise your hand. Edward, um, he had migraines for years eye challenges, completely healed in the name of Jesus. I just, in, ca in case you just think, well, that's a nice Bible thing. It's a today thing. The same God that's in the scriptures is the same God that is available to us today. Uh, I, I learned about Clara. Where's Clara? Clara, Clara, Clara. Hey, Clara. Uh, we did a testimony video two years ago, and uh, a girl on staff, Zahida, uh, she told us about her mom that she had stage four cancer. You may not remember this, but I paused the service, and we prayed for Clara. Clara, stage four cancer, is now cancer-free in the, in the building. How, how's the miracles? Uh, not saying nothing to me. This is all Jesus. I'm just letting you know where you are right now. Like, just in case you're like, I don't know if today's my day. I think today is your day. Yeah. You're in the house of miracles. Yeah. My friends, Jr. and Bobby, they, they attend the first service about a year and a half ago. Um, I have a routine when I, when I come into church. I come out the back and I go that way and I say hey to BJ in the lobby. I say hey to my, I have, a, then I come by and I say hey to Fred right there. I have a routine. And JR and Bobby were the greeters of the center doors. Since I've gone to this church, never not seen JR and Bobby. A year and a half ago, I'm doing my routine and I get to the center doors and JR, JR and Bobby aren't there. And I said, something's wrong. Something is wrong. And come to find out that Bobby, the wife, had been having some 
some mental challenges that were very, very tough. Ended up on nine medications. She just shared her testimony last service. It was beautiful. And my wife and I went to go visit Bobby in uh, what is, what she described as basically the psychiatric ward. And they had stripped her of all media, didn't have her phone, couldn't have a TV, couldn't have a radio. And I remember me and my wife just walked in and we're like, what, what is, why won't they give her something like, it, but, and Amanda, I don't know if you remember this. This is what, this is what she said to us in a hospital room, in, in the psych ward. That she, that's how she described it, okay? This rehabilitation center just down the street here in Carroll. This is what she said. She said, my life will end here. This is how it ends. I, I, this is where it ends. And I'll never forget, about seven, eight months ago, I see JR and Bobby sitting in their spot. <laughs> Hands lifted high in the sky. And I always look for them in their spot. And I don't know if you all know this, but you know you all sit in the same seat every single Sunday. Switch it up every now and then. But I notice when somebody's not in their spot, I'm like, hey, where, where are JR and Bobby? And, and, and she said at one point, she ended up in this uh, uh, assisted living center in Frisco. And uh, she, uh, there was a, an illness in her right leg that she needed a walker for. She said one morning, she woke up and she just went to lunch. And she said, her nurse said, hey, hey, Bobby, where's your walker? She was like, well, I guess I got a miracle. <laughs> How long you want me to go? I'm just letting you know you're in the house of miracles. And I just, I just know some people are like, well, I don't know if today's my day. I, you did not just check a box today. The king of kings is among us. He wants to heal you. So if you would, stand to your feet. Our, our worship team's got a few more songs in them. Our prayer team's got a lot of faith in their heart. And uh, I just believe that today you may need to come down for you. I just believe that today you might need to come down for somebody else. For you, it might be physical. For you, it might be your soul. Maybe you have a loved one that you think they'll never turn around. They'll never get it together. Well, they might if you keep continue to pray. They may, maybe you need to put somebody on speakerphone. Maybe you need to FaceTime somebody right now and say, hey, I've, uh, I know it may not make a lot of sense, but I'm in a house of miracles today. What you need? Jesus is on the main line. Tell them what you want. I believe scoliosis has to bow at the name of Jesus. I believe cancer has to bow at the name of Jesus. I believe mental health has to bow at the name of Jesus. Today's your day. Father, in the name of Jesus, I speak healing over every single person under the sound of my voice. I pray, God, that you would be the same today as you were then. May we know that you cleared the decks for us. May we know that you died for us and that by your stripes we are healed. In Jesus' name, we pray everybody said, amen. Our prayer team's going to be down here. If you need a miracle today, today's your day. Join us as we continue to worship. This is a house of worship. This is a place of prayer.
You are the same God. You touch the lepers, then I feel your touch right now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You're the same God. Sure, the same God. You're the same God. I'm calling on the Holy Spirit, Almighty River, come and fill me again. Oh, come and fill me again. Would you come now? Come and fill me. every head bowed and every eye closed. I want to give each and every person an opportunity to make Jesus the Lord and Savior of their life. There's no greater miracle that can happen in your life than receiving the forgiveness of Christ. You didn't stumble in the church today. This was not an accident. We are not running late. We are just on time. and every eye closed if that's you today you say Ryan I, I want to surrender my life to Christ maybe for you maybe you, you veered off the beaten path maybe today you want to re, rededicate your life to Christ whether you're rededicating your life to Christ or giving your life to Christ for the first time if that's you would you just slip up a hand and say hey Ryan that's me Ryan that's me that's one anybody else that's two 
somebody else. We'll wait for you. Three. That's awesome. Four. I see you all the way in the back. That's awesome. Five. Anybody else? Six. Seven. Anybody else? Eight. Nine. Ten. Eleven. Twelve. Thirteen. Anybody else? Anybody else? Fourteen. Fifteen. That's awesome. We'll wait for you. We got nothing else better to do than to welcome you in to the kingdom of heaven. Anybody else? 16. Anybody else? 17, 18, 19. Anybody else? Hey, can we all say this prayer together? 20, I see you. Can we all say this prayer together? Say, Jesus, thank you for dying on a cross for my sins. I ask now that you would be the Lord and Savior of my life. I surrender my past, my present, and my future to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody say it. Amen. Come on, can we make some noise for all 20 hands? And yes, we count because you have been counted by Jesus. And if you made that decision today, uh, there's something we want to put in your hands just to help you figure out what to do next. If you prayed that prayer today, uh, you can scan the QR code on the screen or text the word SAVED to the number 54636. We're actually going to send you like a seven-day devotional that'll, that'll outline what, what it looks like to walk in a relationship with Jesus. Once again, can we make some noise for every single person that gave the heart to Christ today? If you go to the doctor this week and you discover that a miracle has happened in your life, would you tell us? Would you email us? Would you hit us up on social media? Will you contact us on the website? And, and, and here's why. It is, there's somebody coming in the room that's low on faith, but now they got you. And now they got your testimony. And I just believe that God can do it again. If he did it for you, then he can do it for somebody else. You're in the house of miracles. Hey, you don't want to miss this next weekend. We got a lot of, a lot of fun things going on at both locations. Uh, Pastor Mike's going to be with us on Good Friday. Is that correct? Pastor Mike's in the house today. Pastor Mike's going to be delivering the word Friday night. You don't want to miss that service. And then we've got so many Easter services. You can be in the sunrise service if you'd like. All, all of our early risers at 730. And, um, and all of that information is also on, on the website. Did you have fun in church today? We wouldn't be who we are without you. And I want you to know that. Okay, can I bless you before we go? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and may he give you peace and may he cover you with his precious name, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Have a great week.